Okay, let's do this here. We are live on the air. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be recreating another painting by another one of my favorite artists today. We are going to be looking at the art of Andy Warhol, and more specifically, we're going to be attempting to recreate this painting, one of the most expensive paintings ever sold this is Silver Car Crash Double Disaster from 1963. There's actually a uh, another half of it. This is the other half. <laughs> They're exhibited side by side in their large paintings. Each one is um, eight feet tall and uh, six and a half feet wide so it's uh, 13 feet wide together by eight feet tall which makes it a huge painting you know much larger than the the average person so despite the, the this what it looks like on here it is a they're large it's two large paintings and this is a part of a large series of artworks i think there's about 90 of them in total in the quote-unquote death and disaster series and this is probably not an image of Warhol's that that most people have seen, despite the fact that it is the 34th most expensive, or now the 35th most expensive painting ever sold, uh, and until just recently was one of the most expensive Warhol's. It still is, but uh, a couple of paintings over the past few months have broken that uh, record. Um, but uh, we'll talk all about this image, what's going on here, and we're also going to use a few innovative approaches to painting this. Now, I'm going to do kind of two versions of it. I'm going to do one where I paint the whole thing just using paint brushes, etc. But I'm also going to do this as a stamp or a printmaking exercise as well. And I'm going to do it in a number of different ways. I'm going to use a stamp method that involves just using some styrofoam plates. I'm going to do one that also uses some erasers and we'll use regular acrylic paint like most of you have at home as well as using some printmaking materials that um, you know unless you're a printmaker you probably don't have hanging around so i want to show you a number of different ways that we can use stamping with acrylic paint while we explore the work of andy warhol so uh, let's look at the plan of attack here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the image onto the canvas. So if you want to do it with just paint brushes, just like uh, we normally do, then that's what we'll do. We'll get that started. We're also going to prime the canvases. We're going to get some color on here before we do anything beyond that. So we're going to put uh, a couple of layers, we're gonna put our warm yellow, and then we're gonna put some kind of grayish white paint over top. Then we'll talk about the biography of Andy Warhol. Uh, we, we've done a, a number of Warhol paintings in the past, so we're not gonna spend too much time on that. I think we're, we're just gonna spend more time just talking about this painting and uh, the that Death and Disaster series, as well as Warhol's use of stencils and stamps and appropriation um, and then we'll we'll kind of start going I don't know if we're gonna bounce back and forth here because it's really just it's, it's in, in some ways a very simple straightforward painting how long it will take us is a good question um, it probably at two and a half hours uh, there is a lot of detail and repetition so we'll see we'll see how f fast we can get again if you're watching the episode for the first time consider liking subscribing hitting the notification bell do that right now if you want that would be ideal and um, 
If you want to leave a donation, feel free to do so. There is the super chat function if next to where you can leave comments here in YouTube. You might notice a little dollar sign. If you tap on that, that'll allow you to leave a donation directly through YouTube. But if you want to use PayPal or send me an a, a e-transfer, etc., lots of different ways. Okay, so let's get this image onto the canvas and then we'll kind of get that whole process started. And we've, we've demonstrated this many times in the past. I'm going to show you the uh, the way that I, I I would encourage you to maybe uh, proceed. <laughs> so there's a Dropbox link in the description below. If you click that Dropbox link, you're going to see a whole bunch of folders in here. Like I think there's 160 folders, 170 or something. On the very top, we have our introductory painting episodes. You can see there's room for a couple more that will eventually uh, be produced. And then here's our most basic simple paintings that you know uh, anyone new to painting can do. And then you're going to see 150 or so episodes. These are all paintings we've already done. And if we go to, I think where is it? There's been a little bit of jumping around because we did a little detour talking about Ukrainian artists. Um, and if we click in number 121, Andy Warhol you'll see these files now there will be lots more files in here over the next few months because there is a number of other warhol paintings we'll be doing so if you're looking at this video a year from now you're like there's 20 different files in here which ones are we talking about well it's these ones that say andy warhol silver car crash double disaster right and so you have the two images we saw there previously as well as Let's just zip back down here so you'll see these images that uh, the originals as well as the outlines and I'm going to show you how to transfer these outlines here in a second and if you want this is what uh, this is my interpretation of this image <laughs> if you really want to try to paint it exactly as you see it here now I'm not going to do this second painting. I'm actually just going to do two versions of this one, one using the, the, our, our traditional painting technique and another using stamping technique. So it's up to you. So let's play this video here. I'll just show you how I went about doing this. Okay. So again, as normal, what we're going to be doing is I, I've downloaded the template from the Dropbox and I'm transferring it onto a nine by 12 sized canvas board. And you can use, you can print it off onto ink, using an inkjet printer, laser jet printer, it doesn't matter. You can use a photocopier at work. And I'm gonna tape it down into the, uh, onto the, the canvas here. And then I'm gonna use some carbon tracing paper. You can get graphite tracing paper. It does the same thing. Now this one here uh, is uh, double-sided carbon transfer paper, so it's going to leave a mark on the canvas as well as on the back side of this piece of paper. Now there is a whole bunch of these straight lines, so I'm just using a ruler to do all of this. Let's skip ahead here. You can see, ah, zip, 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 and then I'm just going to go all the way down here. And then uh, here's the reveal that that took how long you know so that was you know probably took me 10 minutes to do all that so it's a bit of a time consuming process to get to that to this point here um, if you want to proceed in this way right now this information here I'm probably I usually keep this just outside of view so I'll leave that there and Let's get some paint on these canvases now. So we'll move on to step number two. Okay, so now that we've got the drawing onto the canvas, what we want to do is apply some color on here. Uh, uh, the imprematura, as the Italians called it which is that first stain, that first layer of paint. And there's lots of different ways about going about this. We've talked about that many, many, many times. 
but uh, the way that I like doing this is using a little bit of warm yellow to do this. And I'm going to use this warm yellow by Amsterdam Paint. And this is what it is. It's the Azo Yellow Deep. Now, I'm not sponsored by this company. They don't pay me a penny. They've never sent me anything for free. I just like this paint because it's it gives us a pretty good cost to quality ratio. It's less expensive. A tube like this costs about $10 American, $14 Canadian, uh, and it, this is a 250 milliliter tube. You can do probably 60, 70 paintings with a tube of paint this big. And if you get all eight of these, you don't even need the black because we usually make our own black paint. Um, you can spend about $125 Canadian, $100 American, and you've got enough paint to keep you busy for about the next six or seven months. And that's if you're making a lot of, you know, 10 paintings a month, right? Most people will probably live and die with these tubes <laughs> still in their possession. Now, you don't have to buy this, this brand of paint if you want to use golden. This is a more expensive uh, so-called professional artist grade paint. And you can see this is the color I would use that is closest to this one here, but it's got a slightly different name. And you'll see that because there's lots of different paints that you can buy. Here's Cadmium Yellow Deep Hue. Here's Windsor & Newton Cadmium Yellow Deep Hue. Here's Artist Loft by uh, Michael's Art Supplies. Uh, here's Deep Yellow, they call it. Buzz Acrylics Cadmium Yellow Hue. Pebo Opaque Primary Yellow. <laughs> Holbein calls it Cadmium Yellow Deep. And Dyler Rowney calls it Cadmium Yellow Deep Hue. Right? So some different names for the same color, which is confusing, but that's uh, how these companies like it because once they get you into their ecosystem, you're trapped. <laughs> right? But you can use paint from different companies and you can mix them all together, no problem. They will probably tell you different but it's okay, right? Um, there's probably slightly difficult, different chemical compositions to these paints, but let's be real there. There's only so many different ways to make acrylic paint. So let's, I'm gonna use this warm yellow and I'm gonna mix it up. Cause I like putting a, this warm yellow underneath all my paints and I've done so for the past few years over the past 225 plus paintings that we've done and I just like this color now we're gonna cover cover it completely with some gray so I know there's always people who who find this whole process very strange but again I'm I want to sh show you the methods of the great artists from the past and you do with it what you want if you want to use this technique or not. Would Warhol have done this? Probably not, actually. Um, <laughs> Warhol, I think, is, is certainly one of the most interesting, most unique characters in art history. Um, and is beloved and despised to this day by many different people around the world. He's a very polarizing figure um which because we'll, we'll get into maybe a little bit more of that when we talk uh we look at some of his art but um uh, I, and i think warhol loved that warhol liked being a little bit di uh, divisive you know, I think he was, as long as people were talking about him, he didn't care whether it was positive or negative. He's one of those guys that would, was like, there's no, um, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? There's just publicity. And if people are saying negative things about you in the press, at least they're talking about you. Do I agree with that? Um, not really. I've had negative press before. And I don't think it's helped me. <laughs> so uh, um, anyway, let's uh, all negative press just because of my art, not be for any any horrible things that I 
that well, I've never done anything horrible in my life, just in case anybody's like, oh, I wonder what's, what horrible demons are hiding in the closet of Michael Markowski. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm coating this with my warm yellow. And then I'm going to blow dry these, and then I'm going to put some of this gray color. It's actually a bit of a silver. And you know what? I just realized, I wonder if I have, I've got silver oil paint. Um, I don't know if I've got silver acrylic paint. I might have some iridescent stuff we could try mixing in here. So I'm just trying to get a nice even coating of paint. Remember, all of this is going to get covered in a few moments, so it will seem kind of like a big waste of time. But that color will just will is sort of like I don't know mustard in a sandwich. Maybe you can't see it when you're looking at the sandwich from the outside, but when you bite into it, you'll taste that mustard. And I'm, I'm a big lover of mustard. Maybe that's why I, I like this kind of mustardy color. And I can't fathom a sandwich without mustard in it. That just seems um, very, very sad to me that someone could possibly put a sandwich in their mouth without mustard. Okay, so I'm going to uh, blow dry these here. And then uh, we'll get started with the next step. I'm just going to mute the mic. Okay, so now we've got these paintings primed. A little bit of paint on the edge, not surprising. Um, one of the things, you know, often if there's a, a paint that is a little bit thick and it takes obviously longer to dry when it's thicker, just rubbing your hand over it is, is going to help kind of um, spread that paint out. It might, it's going to take obviously some of that paint off. But it'll spread it out a little bit so that it can speed up that drying time. So it's not just a big puddle of paint there. Because I'm going to paint this or white over top. And if there's all this yellow on the edges that's wet, that's going to get into the paint and change that color. Not that that's a huge deal. I wouldn't mind that so much. I don't. Warhol himself certainly wouldn't have minded. I'm sure he would have been like, he would have said, that's great. 
that's great i like that yeah that's great <laughs> i was just looking my daughter and i went to the library and earlier today and picked up some library books which i'll show you here in a moment um and one of them was called that's great <laughs> uh because <laughs> warhol uh, it, because that's a famous saying of his is like basically liking everything no matter what and you just be like yeah that's great i love that people would say well what about this yeah that's great let's do that too sure yeah absolutely okay no but what about this option b yeah that's great i love that let's do you want to do all of it yeah let's do it all that sounds great <laughs> so um okay so I'm, what i'm about to do is make a big batch of black paint and so i'm using i got my cool yellow cool blue and warm red it's usually i put it over here but since i'm just going to mix a big mixture here it's like might as well just put it right there for starters right let's just go right to that okay i mean we could make or just use black paint but i want to make my own gray because i always just think this is an introductory painting class I know we've talked about this before, but many, many people are watching for the very first time. So the more, so I, I don't want to assume anything that people know how to do this. So to make a black, we're going to, by mixing these colors together, they're all crisscrossing around what we call the neutral core, right? And so cool blue and warm red are, are they're not quite opposite from one another on the cool, on the color wheel. But when we mix these two colors to together, as opposed to warm blue and cool red, which gives us a really nice purple, this is going to give us a much a pretty muddy color. So let's kind of just go ahead and start mixing these. So if we start mixing and it looks a little bit brown, that's probably means we've got a bit of a lot of red and we need a little bit more blue. So let's put a bit more blue in here. Not sure why I use this big brush because I think a lot of this paint is going to get um, washed out. Okay, so what we want is that purple color that we see here now. But that purple, let's, I'm going to go to a smaller brush here and mix this. Um, the thing with the purple is that it's not black or gray or anything like that, right? It's still got a lot of color, but by add, adding some yellow to it, we're going to kill that, the intensity, the saturation of that color and drag it right into the middle of the, the neutral core. So it may or may not be coming across that well on camera, but that's pretty close to a, the darkest color that we can get from what we call a split, split primary palette. I'm just wondering, maybe I maybe I will use some black today because I, I do own, I don't have, um, With my printmaking colors, I don't have a, the, the colors to replicate a black. So anyway, I'm just thinking out loud. Let's take our white now. Whoa, I wasn't even paying attention and that's too much. <laughs> so I'm like looking the other way. Wow, that's a lot of white. Let's take uh, some of it out. We'll just put it onto this side here. Okay, so let's mix our gray. What does that gray look like? Um, or it's technically, again, a silver. It, 
it, it obviously just looks gray here on camera um, it's basically a very light gray let's take some of that mix this into that color the other thing too when we when, if we've mixed this color and then we put it into our if you mix that color and add white to it you'll very clearly and quickly see what it the the whether it's a brown or green or blue or black or etc so adding white to a dark color is a great way of just instantly revealing what it is now I'm going to add some of this matte medium to the mixture here which is going to make it a little bit more transparent so that I preserve a little bit of that um, yellow that I just put down right I don't want to just obliterate that whole thing okay and that's this is just matte medium is just paint that has no color in it it's clear now you can get gloss medium as well as matte medium let's move that out to the side let's just start with this one okay Oh, I just remembered I was going to mix some iridescence in here. Hmm. That's glitter. It's not... I know I have iridescence and... Hmm. Should we try putting glitter on this surface? I'm sure Warhol would approve. He would just be like, that's great. That's great. Yeah, glitter. Mm, love it. <laughs> I took a um, two classes on Andy Warhol when I was in graduate school. I, we've talked about this before. And... Uh, they kind of changed my life. I just, I loved uh, immersing myself in the world of Andy Warhol. So that's one of them. This is the one that has no underdrawing or anything. So we'll just, uh, should I put glitter? If I was going to put glitter on it, let's do a little, let's try a bit of glitter. Let's just, this one's going to be our kind of more experimental one anyway. Glitter, though, just gets everywhere, so let's, uh, this could be my undoing. <laughs> I'm just going to put this on, a, on here so that uh, if I do make a mess, I... Now I'm going to have glitter in my dreams. Ah! I'm sure that doesn't come across on camera, but I think I'm actually just going to go run my hands under the sink here. So this is just... Um, where did I get this? Stats. I think I, I've had this for years. Stats, I think, is an American. Probably got this in Los Angeles. Because um, I don't think we have stats in Canada. So I'm just going to um, wash my hands. Okay. 
Okay, nice clean, glitter-free fingers, right? <laughs> Probably not for long, because this is going to get all over the place. So that's just, you know, there's, it's, there's more in some places than others. Hopefully some of that paint will still have been wet enough to absorb some of that glitter. And uh, so we'll, we'll see. Let's just move this fellow off to the side. And let's get this one prepped. I think I gotta make a little bit more of my gray. So I guess I need more white. I thought I had way too much. Um. So I have about like one to one paint to matte medium, which just makes this transparent enough Oh, okay, so that got a little bit of purple in there because there was probably a little bit of purple. So let's just take some of that yellow. Ooh. I was hoping to, yeah, I guess that kind of worked. It's got a teeny bit more of a yellowish quality. Very, very subtle. It still has a gray... Um, okay, mix that in all together. And let's do this one. Uh, Paula says, the car crash image reminds me of my one a few months ago. That's scary. Oh my goodness. So let's mix more matte medium in there. Yikes. So that's a lot of, uh, it's pretty thick, Michael. Well, I think you've definitely fared better than the people that were in these pictures because Warhol deliberately picked paintings of fatal car accidents for this series. So um, we're glad that you walked away, Paula, from your car accidents, your car accident. So I've got a little just too much paint on here, so I'm just kind of scraping it off. of it has disappeared I could keep on scraping off let's just use a rag to pull even more off And then just spreading that paint around. Put a bit back.
there's gonna be a lot of black paint on here so while I mean I guess on camera that looks totally fine it, there's definitely a lot of yellow coming through in some places okay so it's always better just to underdo it to put a little bit more matte medium in and then if you need to you can add more I'm just gonna move this and use a bit of water to clean this table here Okay, I'm gonna blow dry it. Okay, so one of the reasons I'm cleaning the table is because I got some library books and I don't want these library books to get all wrecked because of the paint that we're applying <laughs> on here. So trying to be a good, uh, a good library patron because I think we've all taken those library books up from the library where every page has been highlighted and underlined and you're like what who was who used this book before me ah and since i'm not going to be painting for a few minutes here i'm just going to clean all of this extra paint off these brushes um <laughs> Donna says, say, Michael, you don't look like you would, you're would. you the type to get into a lot of trouble. Well, you could... I'm probably chiefly responsible for <laughs> my parents' gray hairs and my dad for losing most of his, so they would probably beg to differ. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, that, that, that was... You know, the typical stuff that any teenager sort of gets themselves into trouble for, right? Um, Dolores says, Hi, everyone. I haven't been watching for several days, but I'm interested in seeing this one. And there's uh, Heidi there as well. Great. Lots of people watching too. So, okay. Let's move on to the, the next step here. So let's talk a little bit about Warhol, who he was, and why we're focusing on this painting in particular, or, or the importance of this painting in particular. So as I said, we've, we've done episodes on Warhol in the past. We painted his famous soup can and banana uh, probably two years ago or, or more. I don't know how long ago we did that. So if you're interested, there are links down below, or you can go to my YouTube page and you can find that original video. It was before we even started the Master Study series. So um, check those uh, those out. Oh, there's my mom saying, Michael was a perfect child. Oh, only a mother could say such a thing. Uh, uh, okay, 
So, thank you, Mom. Love you. Uh, let's look at Andy Warhol's biography here. So, Warhol was born in 1928 and dies in 1987 at age 58, um, which was a big surprise. Warhol died sort of controversially. I think he it was like his appendix, I think, was being taken out and he died on the operating table there was actually major lawsuits that resulted from that because obviously that's not the type of um, uh, procedure that one expects uh, someone to have complications on right I can't if it was appendix or a spleen or some some kind of relatively common surgery anyway um, so considering the amount of work that he was able to accomplish in r really a relatively short period of time from the early 1960s until he passes away in 18 or 1987 that's really 25 years of of his career and he created you know a, a seismic amount of like of artwork a ton of different stuff and, and using often the printmaking techniques which allowed him to create many many multiples or slightly different variants of the same image so that 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 way he would he could do like a hundred Marilyn Monroe paintings in a couple of days the kind of thing that would have taken Rembrandt or Vermeer a, a lifetime to do Warhol was able to do in a several days which is why he called his studio the factory right so let's uh, just take a quick look at his biography. Uh, Warhol's famously born in Pittsburgh, and now they're in Pittsburgh. There is the Warhol Museum and Library, which is um, the the Warhol. I think what's it called? The Warhol Foundation is one of the um, the most um, philanthropic arts organizations that exists is it, especially if you're living in the United States a lot of museums art galleries exhibitions are sponsored by the Warhol Foundation so it's incredible that he used the the money that he accrued during his career to to help support other artists um, in his wake because Warhol grew up in a family that was not particularly artsy um, he was sort of a little bit of a uh, outcast growing up. Warhol is kind of a, a gay icon and growing up in Pittsburgh during the 1940s and being a, a gay effeminate child, you know, was probably very difficult for him. And he did not have a lot of great memories of his youth except the experiences spent that he had with his mother. His mother just like my mom here, um, uh, was a, featured prominently in his life. And later on, when Warhol is in his 40s and 50s, he's living in New York City, and he's going out partying all the time, he's working all the time, he m moves his mother into his apartment. And him and his mother, he, she... She lives with him throughout, you know, the the, the his rise to fame, and um, and again, that's probably pretty uncommon, right? Not a lot of major global celebrities have their mother living just down the hall from them in their in their apartments, right? So, um, in in that way, Warhol was always very directly connected to his family and to uh, to this important figure that had kind of insulated and nurtured him throughout his career, or his, his especially his his earlier life for sure. Now, again, I don't want to go through too much of this stuff we've talked about before. His sort of rise, um, maybe it is worth saying though that Warhol. Uh, made his his career early on as an illustrator and he became a very famous illustrator in and making illustrations that were reproduced in many of the, the the most important magazines in New York at the time so this is a little book Andy Warhol angels and angels there, there's a number of, of books like this of like 
cats, Andy Warhol dogs, Andy Warhol fruits and vegetables, etc. Because he did a lot. Now, what we're looking at here, these are our early Warhol drawings. So, or not early. These would have been. Will it tell us in here? Maybe at the back. So these are you know, like on the front cover. This is 1955. There, so throughout the 1950s, he's making drawings like this using um, a technique where he's painting on a piece of paper, or he, he draws these lines uh, with ink on a piece of paper, folds the paper together, which and then pulls them apart, which is how we get this kind of blotted line. Let's see if there's another version, another image here that really shows it well. Maybe, you see these sort of like blobs that form, which generally would be very undesirable, but Warhol was one of those kind of persons that, that saw that kind of blotting of the ink as an exciting, unexpected occurrence that he could take advantage of. Let's just see if there's a few more. Right, I just think these are really beautiful. Also, Warhol is is kind of seen as, as this, as like the Antichrist by some people who think that he destroyed art. There's a lot of people, even to this day, who despise Warhol and think that his influence not only had negative consequences for the art world, but culturally beyond, right? Warhol famously said, everyone will be, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. And someone who was kind of absorbed and fascinated by celebrity. And now we live in a culture where people just want to be celebrities. I know when, I, when I've taught in elementary schools, high schools, um, and I've, I, I do often one of the projects I do with kids is we talk about like your dreams and what you want to do when you grow up. And I can't tell you how many times I've asked that question. And the majority of people, kids in the classroom will say, I want to be famous. I want to be famous. And you're like, well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, what do you want to be famous for? Oh, um, I, uh. I haven't really got to that point. I just want to be famous. I just want to be rich. I just want to have a lot of cool things. I want to be, and it's like, okay, okay. But you have to do something to become famous. And now we live in a culture where there's a lot of these, you know, celebrities who you're just like, what exactly did they do to cause us to be in any way fascinated by these people? Like the Kardashians, for instance, right? Um, anyway, so so these this gives us an idea of, of Warhol's early career making these. He did illustrations, a lot of shoes for shoe companies, um, shoe advertisements. Um, so Warhol made his his name as an illustrator. There was a um, uh, I think in the, by the late 1950s, there was you know one of these magazine articles like the 50 most powerful people in New York for instance and Warhol made that list because of his influence as an illustrator so when Warhol decided to transition from the advertising illustration world where he had become not only famous but relatively wealthy and decided to cross over into art there was a lot of resentment about that because the movement that was happening in the 1950s was called the Abstract Expressionist Movement. And if you think about who the, the leading figures of that movement were, that was people like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Willem de Kooning, Robert Motherwell. Lots of men, very macho guys, right? Big, you know, tough guys making big paintings throwing paint around it's there's a lot of testosterone masculine energy right and then you have warhol this effeminate gay man who is walks around in a suit and tie unlike these guys with their jeans and t-shirts and rolled up sleeves smoking and drinking and getting in fights at the cedar tavern in lower manhattan warhol walks into the room and decides to to 
become a, a visual artist and make paintings. That was, and famously Warhol wrote about this in a great book called Popism, the Warhol 60s. We've talked about that book before. Highly recommend it. It's a very easily readable book. Warhol was a great writer and his, his, his writing um, is, he, he writes a lot like People Magazine because Warhol, you know, liked to think that he had no attention span. And uh, I'm just trying to, pull this book up here um, so this is the the book this is the, the version I have somewhere in a box over here but you can see they've reprinted it with a slightly different color great book again I highly recommend this book um, because he, he not only talks about what was going on in his life but what was going on elsewhere in culture during the 1960s the Beatles and Bob Dylan and so on and so forth right in Warhol was sort of this nexus around which all of this stuff was swirling and a lot of people wanted to be around him because he knew all those other people, right? So Warhol Studio, especially at night, was a place where you would walk into the room and you could find Mick Jagger and uh, uh, Margaret Trudeau, the Prime Minister's well, I guess former wife, I think, by that point, right? Pierre Trudeau's Margaret Trudeau. I think that was bef after they separated, I think. I'm trying to... But that was, again, famously scandalous. What is Margaret Trudeau, the, the prime minister's wife or ex-wife, doing? Hanging out with Mick Jagger and there's... You know, every day in the on the cover or you know in the the society section of the newspaper, there'd be some craziness related to what's going on in Warhol's factory or his studio, right? Um, let's. Uh, it is interesting, you know, the the painting that uh, just recently sold for I think a hundred and fifty eight million dollars. <laughs> The Warhol uh, Marilyn is also known as one of the shot Marilyns, which was uh, a painting that was hanging in Warhol's studio when Warhol was shot by a woman named Valerie Solanus. And perversely, those paintings that the bullet went through Warhol and then hit those paintings is one of the reasons those paintings have extra value, um, which is something I guarantee you despite how kind of macabre that sounds, Warhol would have loved that. He would have been like, wow, that is great. Yeah, absolutely. There's that, like, wow, maybe somebody else should shoot me through another part of my body and we'll make, we'll try and get as, that bolt to go through as many paintings as possible. We'll line them all up and we'll double the prices, right? That's the kind of person Warhol was. Um, but it just, I just mentioned that because it's interesting that that assassination attempt happens in 1968, but the the work that Warhol does in this death and disaster series happened between 1962 and 1963, you know, so about five years before this own very dark moment happens in his life. Um, let's see. Uh, gallbladder. That was the surgery that he had uh, that uh, caused his death or, or inadvertently led to his death. Anyway, uh, let's look at... There's got tons of links here. We're not, I don't want to go through all of them, but this is the painting that we're doing today. So, what was it? Purchased for $105 million at auction in 2013. And I'm... I, I, no one knows exactly who bought it at the time when it was sold it, it was the most expensive warhol painting ever sold um the next one was a hundred the previous marker was a hundred million for the eight elvises which we are going to be painting uh in about a m three weeks i think from now and that one has since surpassed this one so this so one of the things with with warhol is the the prices and value of his paintings keep on going up and up and a lot of the times, it wouldn't surprise me if this is just sitting in a warehouse, accruing value, waiting to be sold again, and somebody will buy it, not even take it out of the crate, and just flip it again, right? All of which, again, many, there's lots of artists that think that that's this horrible thing that's happening in the art world 
these days this speculation on art or investment in art purely you know people buying art purely as an investment without any interest in in the art itself I, again i'm sure War, warhol would have just been fascinated by that wow that is great i think that's fantastic i'm sure what you said um just before i finish some of these i thought this was interesting just doing a little bit of research people talking is was there any um connection between ralph nader's book unsafe at any speed and the the death and disaster series um i was like oh that's was there any connection maybe on on ralph nader's side because that book comes out in 1965 and was really the the research that led to seat belts being installed in cars because of all the accidents and people being th ejected, thrown from their cars, like in number of the paintings here. But as I said, Warhol's paintings were done three years before Ralph Nader's book was, was released. And one of the interesting things that, um, I wonder if it's, there's a, a couple of quotes. Um, Here's just some of Warhol's early drawings, 1948, 1955. Let's see if I can, here's a, a quote that Warhol had. So Warhol uh, is sort of challenged by one of his, his, his gallery dealers to 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 sort of change up his uh the the art that he's making the art that warhol was making at the beginning of the 1960s is some of the stuff he's most famous for the soup cans the bananas the merrill monroe paintings the um, elizabeth taylor elvis a lot of these famous celebrities and one of his dealers is like you know, there's a lot of this sort of very positive stuff. What about something a little bit darker? Because a lot of artists have explored some of the darker sides of humanity. Um, and so encouraging him to maybe see if there's something there. So uh, Warhol decides to embark on this series, the, the Death and Disaster series. But, um, you know, this kind of quote here, he says... So he made this painting of a car crash or an airplane crash. He says, um, when you see a gruesome picture over and over again, it really doesn't have any effect. So this idea that Warhol, um, I think is pretty prophetic in that at, during Warhol's career, the, the idea of the mass media really achieves its kind of zenith. Um, it's, it's grown even more to this day, but but the the ability for like he's just on the cusp of like CNN starting up in the early 1990s and the kind of these the the 24 hour news cycle um, showing the same gruesome you know mass murder and violence and you know nuclear threats and all these things over and over and over and over again right and what he's saying is that like kind of i think one of the motivations for pursuing this uh these darker images is he's almost trying to rehabilitate them and to kind of take away the the um the 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 violence from them and to and and to make them just beautiful images again which you know some people be like that's ridiculous how can you take the worst moment in someone's life and um inoculate it and and make it positive right so here's this is i won't zoom in too close here but this is one of the images that he uses that he reproduces in in one of his series this is the original photograph we see people trapped inside of a car that's been flipped um, let's see if we can find, like, so he's, he's, he also does paintings of some of these, um, kind of the, the racial riots that were happening in the 1960s and the violence that, uh, 
that um, we saw here. Here's one of Warhol's. Uh, this is another one of these car crash images. But again, by, by reproducing it dozens and dozens of times, it sort of starts to blur into just um, almost like a non-representational image. We stop seeing the car crash and we just see kind of patterns. And uh, for some people that that's incredibly blasphemous, but um, I, it is, I think it accomplishes what he's thinking about the critique of the mass media. So here's, for instance, this is similar to the to the one that just sold recently. Uh, no, this is not the the one that was shot. But you can see just before we, you know, what he starts doing with these images. He starts using the silk screen and applying them all on one canvas. And then he starts getting really fascinated by this look of paint of the silk screen because he's he's using a printmaking method. He's not painting all of these with a paintbrush. He's silk screening it like you know a t-shirt or a poster is made, right? But he gets really interested where the, the screen gets kind of filled and it stops making nice, clean, clear images. Which if I, I remember taking printmaking classes, and if you were to hand in a project like this back in the day, you'd 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 fail. <laughs> you'd the teacher would be like, Are you crazy? These are the worst prints ever. Every print should look exactly the same. And Warhol is the kind of person to just be kind of like, why? Why does the print need to be exactly the same? That's no fun. What if every print was different? And people are like, no, 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 you don't, you, you don't understand the whole purpose of printmaking. The purpose of making printmaking is you can make a print and it's going to look exactly the same as everyone else's print. And we're all like, oh, but that's kind of boring. Wouldn't it be cool if we had ones where some are really dark and some are clear or some are barely there? Like, and <laughs> so Warhol is just constantly kind of inverting the expectations, right? And almost in a, like, I think he would like to think in a, in a very, people would dismiss him as being very naive but I think he knew exactly what he was doing. So here's someone, a photograph of someone jumping out of a building. It's called a woman's suicide from 1962. Here's another car crash. This image was earlier of someone who fell out of a building onto the top of the car. I won't show that the, the original image. Um, right, so here's another person jumping out of a building. But the way that it sort of starts to distort you know, it becomes kind of confusing as to what's actually there. This is another Warhol painting. This one sold for $70 million, Green Disaster. Um, this is the image we were looking at before, the car that was flipped over and the people that are trapped inside. Orange car crash. And I'm sure he made probably a dozen other copies with different colors, etc. This is just what we have in this book, but... You know, so here's, you know, another version of it. Like this weird placement on a giant canvas to do that and leave the whole side blank. Or like this one to do this one in the middle, but to just kind of fit another one on the bottom. Like really strange sort of approach to printmaking. So, you know, Warhol uh, probably did more to overturn many of the assumptions of printmaking than anyone had prior, I'm sure, by far. And there's been a lot of other people who since have made, kind of taken his contributions and really ran with it. All right. um, so we can look at this book all day. I just think these are fascinating. Um, same sort of thing. Here's Elizabeth Taylor from Cleopatra. Uh, that famous movie. You can see how like there's just not clean prints. All of these are technically like really, really poor efforts at printmaking. <laughs> um, it should also be said that Warhol did the initial uh, prints himself, and then as he got he was starting to sell them, he would hire people to help them. And then it's believed that one of his primary assistants, Gerard Malanga, 
did most of the prints after a certain period of time. And again, that was one of the things that was very taboo. Most artists going all the way back to you know the beginning of painting had people helping them, uh, apprentices. We've talked about like a studio where you know you might have uh, apprentices who paint everything but the faces and hands and feet and then Rembrandt would come in and finish those little bits right Warhol when asked about about his paintings and people I, we've heard rumors that other people have done some of your paintings like oh yeah I don't I don't even do that I don't even know what's coming out of the factory anymore I, I don't even it's just I've signed my name on stuff I've even taught people how to sign my name for me people are like what that's outrageous so this this thing that people thought like oh we've caught him we figured out what he's up to that he's he's this dilettante that is kind of b b flooding the market with all of this um uh knockoffs or he's not even he doesn't even touch the canvases ha huh, that'll be his downfall and then warhol is it, un to everyone's surprise not only admits it but sort of boasts about it He's like, oh yeah, no, I, I don't do most of my paint. I've kind of retired from painting now. I get my, I don't even know who's who's back there producing it. People are like, no, 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 no. That's a bad thing. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, really? Is I, 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 I really like what people are doing, and, and you know, in my name, I think that's great. <laughs> so, I, the, you can see why some people would be furious with Warhol and. Um, Actually, maybe just really quickly, I also just want to mention I've, I've heard a, you know some chatter in, on the Facebook group about like um, people feeling maybe ashamed of using the templates and like only a really like if you're a good artist, you would draw everything out by eye. And Warhol, you know, because that that's the, this myth that artists have cultivated over six seven hundred years is that the the great artists are just magical geniuses who just sort of touch their paintbrush onto the canvas and poof a perfect rendition of someone's face but they don't want anybody to know that they were using lenses and mirrors and projections and tracing and all, whatever technique was available that's why no one was allowed into the studio to see how the sausage was made warhol on the other hand boasted about the fact that he used all of those techniques and so this is just a, just a random book of some of the late Warhol paintings but Warhol used projectors to and he would project an image onto a canvas and then trace it uh, this is some of the originals this just gives you an idea just really quickly some of the um, newspaper magazine articles that he would like clip images from so he was like he would just take these and then put them under an opaque projector this is kind of a famous painting or this is the original the source material because uh, he did this famous one of, of this nose job here uh, much larger but he would just take this project it onto a canvas paint it then sell it <laughs> And he hadn't. He it didn't bother him at all that um, people. Um, so here's another, just a clipping from the newspaper. So I just think whenever people get all up in arms about an artist who's cheating by using whatever technique is possible or available to them is just really someone who has bought into you know a few hundred years of propaganda that artists have been putting out there to try to convince people of their genius okay so let's move on So the, our next exercise usually here is to do some underpainting. I don't think we're going to do any underpainting on this particular painting because we're just going to, I think, just go right to it. Um, 
we've got the backgrounds painted so i don't think we need to do anything more to the background so let's just go right to our foreground and i think um wonder what the best approach here i think what i'll do is let's get one of these started I'll, I'll, I'll maybe i'll paint one or two panels here and then i'll set this aside and then I'm going to explore some printmaking techniques just to show you different ways that we could approach this project. And then after I've done a little bit of that, I'll come back and I'll just finish this here. So that because this that, you know, each one of these is probably going to take me 15 minutes. So you can do the math and figure out how long that would be. And uh, so we'll just sort of maybe spend half an hour on one of these. So um, where's my paintbrush? I got it little one here probably do most of this with just a small little paintbrush maybe i'll have another little bit bigger one here just for so these are just pretty small little details and as i said before i like to keep my template kind of nearby to refer to even though I'll, I, I have the original photograph sometimes having the template just as i just find easier to just kind of when I'm painting, look at this, then raise my head and look at the screen, etc. Right? So. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my the dark color that we had here uh, previously, and I'm just going to paint with it. Now I'm going to have to probably make this color a few different times. So that's going to mean that this might change my my quote unquote black might might change. And in fact, maybe this is an opportunity to do that deliberately to add make it a little bit more purpley or a little bit more green or a little bit more blue or red, etc. So that I do have some variation in that. That seems very Warholian to allow for not only allow for some difference and distortion but to actively kind of cultivate that right so let's um we're gonna, let's zoom in on a part of this here let's i'm just gonna start the top left oh i just wiped paint into my eye here that's great okay i'm gonna have to <laughs> go to the sink and just run my some water over my eye here So I don't have a, a mirror down here, so <laughs> see if there's any paint on there. Okay, that was funny. Uh, it's funny that it's taken 300 episodes before I got paint on all over my face, but maybe that, maybe that's happened many times before I haven't noticed. Okay, <laughs> so let's. right up top here oh come on and okay So you know what? I'm I'm probably also just going to use a little bit of my uh, glazing fluid, right? I'm going to use matte glazing fluid. Satin and matte mean the same thing, and I'm just going to put a little bit of this in my paint, just to make it a little bit more fluid and maybe even just a little bit more transparent, so that 
maybe I can get away with um, blending or blurring things out a little bit. So it looks like this is white, but it will dry totally clear, right? The other thing with glazing fluid is it has um, some properties which will slow the drying time down. So that's also very helpful if you make a quote unquote mistake and you're using paint, uh, acrylic paint that's got a medium in it that will slow the drying time down, then we can just easily wipe it away. We don't have to worry about like, oh, I've painted it. What am I going to do? I'm kind of got to make it work or right. So it, it sort of turns acrylic painting more into like an oil painting process. Okay. So this is wild, isn't it? Um, hmm. How do we want to do this? There's part of me that thinks maybe I should just do this with uh, paint it all black and then paint white back over top of it. Um, There's something like deeply bizarre to me about trying to do this painting in this way, but uh, because I think it's going to, well, we'll see, maybe we'll see some level of recognizability for of a car in here, it's debatable. So I'm not going to be too concerned about obviously replicating these images exactly as we see them. I think this is some sort of, I think this is a post that the cars are kind of wrapped around. So how many, there's one, two, three, five, one, two, three, four, five. So we've got 15 of these to go. So as I said, I'm just gonna do a bit of, uh, I'll do maybe do the first one or two here, and then we'll explore a different process. So, you know, now that I'm, I'm, I'm approaching kind of the, be the end of this sort of technique right here, there's two, maybe there's different ways that we can go about this. Like, because the, the inside of the, ch the, the chair, we could do this with a lot of glazing fluid. Like, let's say I could take glazing fluid and really dilute my paint here. Make it very thin. 
so that I can paint in something like this ch chair. And even maybe a bit of the road down here. Maybe, uh, let's, I'll do that. Then I can just take my paint, my, again, and kind of just paint a little bit more over top of things and make it a little bit darker. This needs to be darker here. that is I just sort of went off of my own there So there's, that's one. How about let's go down to the next one, just below here. Maybe I'll just, I'll just even leave these in place. Maybe with this one, we could do a bit more of a dry brush technique. So I'm just gonna use the paint as I did originally. And then uh, to get some of the lighter areas, I'll just, rather than using um, glazing medium or matte medium to kind of thin it, I'm just gonna, use the dry part of my brush. So I'm going to kind of start by trying to kind of capture the majority of what was there. This one's much darker, isn't it, right?
kind of big dark shape here. I think what's kind of neat is the is the different images seem to kind of reveal different things. And I think that's maybe another thing that Warhol's thinking about is the repetition of an image while sometimes it it might completely kind of obscure what was there before and it loses its meaning. Sometimes it's in the 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 duplication and endless repetition of something that allows us to see something like the the truth behind something eventually um, okay so I'm just gonna take my brush I'm just going to wipe it dry a bit. Let's just take some paint. Get that on my brush. Just take some of the excess paint off. I'm just going to paint a little bit in here. And just sort of scrub with a dry brush on the canvas. that paint was a bit wet so that's okay I mean it's it's definitely looks bizarre and weird now um, but I'm sure Warhol would have loved that now do I I, I don't know if I want to do any quote-unquote fixing of things like if I don't like the where it's placed I think I'm happy just letting it stay like that and just trying not to fix anything allow it to be take this like very warholian approach on things allow it just to um to stay just like it is i do just want to just take this color and just darken a little bit more That looks, I mean, I, who knows what this is going to look like by the time we're done. It, this could look really cool or just sort of like, well, that was weird. I can't believe we spent time doing that. Okay, so I'm going to move this off to the side and let's do a stamping technique now. Um, and I want to show you a few different ways of going about this. So the first method we're going to learn is, is using just an old paper plate. Or not an old, it could, it could be old, or it could be new, not paper plate, styrofoam plate. So you can buy styrofoam sheets at an art supply store, and those work great. Be a little bit loud. Uh, so I'm instead we just could just cut that shape out. Now it's not pretty or centered or whatever. That's okay. We just want that kind of image. Now, if you recall when I I made this template I used double-sided carbon paper which meant that not only was it transferred onto the canvas but a reverse image has been transferred onto the back side of my paper so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trace one of these onto onto my um, 
uh, styrofoam here. So I just want to see which one here is maybe looks the best. They all look pretty wild and different. Um, kind of like this one here. <laughs> um, and I'm going to move, let's, I'm going to tape it down. And I'm going to use my carbon transfer paper. And then we'll use a pen. Now, we have to remember, so when we're using this material, right, if we draw a line, where that line will be is where the white will be. Right, so you kind of almost have to think in, in maybe reverse because if I do a whole bunch of these lines, that's where the white will be. Where the, I did not do a line is where the black will be. All right, so let's actually, I wonder if I can take this image. I wonder if I'll be able to flip it. Okay, so I just inverted it. So now we can kind of see what this image looks like. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go over these lines and then I'll do it on the opposite side here. So let's just kind of get the basics. very lightly ah nothing transferred okay well that's okay I thought we would get an image transfer but none has so that doesn't make sense I just want to make sure showing up there hmm okay I think it's probably because I'm using pretty thick paper to do this, so the image isn't coming across very clearly, but that's okay. Okay, so I'm actually just get the a ruler. <laughs> 
so now as I said every place that's got that I've drawn in will end up being white on the canvas everything that is not will be black right so now we want to maybe go in and try to draw down all these surfaces This is going to look like chaos because this is this is not <laughs> that this technique here is is but the the most rudimentary possible. So the results are probably going to be less than ideal. I mean, it's possible that we could get some really cool result out of this. I'm <laughs> not very hopeful. I'm just wanted to kind of show that you know I probably could have picked another image that would showcase this technique better. Um, but I want to have a little bit of fun. So the only way to find out how well this works is by actually inking it up and using it. So I'm wondering, should we? Let's use the printmaking ink first, and uh, and then we'll we'll use regular acrylic paint afterwards. Let's move that out of the way. So we'll get our our canvas that we're gonna stamp onto. Let's see. There's got all this glitter. Sorry, it's loud, isn't it? There's a reason why glitter has basically been banned in schools here in Vancouver because it's a mess like they look they've literally banned it because um well well primarily because they say that it's um it gets into the water and then fishes are eating it and uh, that's not desirable but i think it's also because teachers get tired of cleaning it up like i've got paint in my eye and i got glitter all over the place i am going to be um, one funny looking person by the end of this. Okay. Let's move that out of the way. Uh, where is that? Okay. So to, to use, to do printmaking, I have glass that I, I've, cause I've done these, the same sort of exercise with kids in classrooms. And so I, I have all of the, the, the required materials to do a really good job at this. But um, I, again, I want to show how we can do this with the, the least amount of materials possible. Ideally, glass works really well as an inking plate because it's very easy to clean and this doesn't stick to it. The next best is, is plexiglass. But of course, plexiglass is uh, acrylic based. And if we're going to put an acrylic paint onto it, then there, that, that can bind uh, and stick to one another in a way that is maybe less desirable. Whereas glass, nothing's going to stick to it quite well, at least, at least not for very long. So here what we have, Speedball is is uh, is sort of like the, the, the name in printmaking. And they make printmaking ink, and I have all sorts of tools here I can maybe show a little bit later, um, like carving tools, etc. 
but this is for like block printing, right? So what we'll do is we'll squeeze a bit of this out onto the canvas. Now, the thing with printmaking ink, what makes it it's kind of special is that it's actually very thick and opaque. And it is like, if you, this would be the least desirable paint to paint with because it is so thick that trying to get any sort of nice details from it is would just drive you bonkers, right? So I have two of these rollers and I think I, I don't know where I got these. Uh, um, I think from Michael's Art Supplies. You can spend more money on ones that are rubberized. These are just all plastic. Again, I use these with kids, so I want like the ones that are the least, <laughs> that can take a lot of punishment. But ideally you want something that's got a little bit more of a rubberized surface. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna ink this up here, my roller. We want it to be even. This is just the top of, you can see an Ikea, <laughs> um, which I'm gonna call it uh, bin, bin lid, box lid. So I wanna have a, a kind of a, a relatively even a coating on here. I don't wanna have big globs of paint or, or ink, sorry. So technically this is ink, not paint. Um, let's do this right here. So now I'm gonna take it and ink up my image. Now it does, you know, it. The, again, so this, it's very thick and tacky it will it starts to dry relatively quickly but uh let's put this to the side where's my glitter mess here <laughs> okay and let's start in the top left corner I wonder what, how all this glitter is going to behave in here. Okay, we'll put this down. We'll see. I mean, I'm again, my expectations are very low. Now what we want to do is is just try to press this ink out here. Now you, you sort of don't want to press too hard because otherwise it's going to squish everything out. You also don't want to press too light, otherwise you won't get a print at all. So let's see the moment of truth. Dun, 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 dun. Oh my goodness, I can hardly wait. This is so exciting. Will this be a disaster or a revelation? Hmm, not bad. Not bad. Okay. Let's do, how many more do we, so we got 15 of these to do. Now we can keep on using this. So let's, uh, let's, let's see, let's do maybe, you know, I'm kind of digging it. I almost want to do the whole thing this way. Um, maybe should I, should I do the whole thing this way? Is that crazy? Do that again. Now I'm I'm I, I'm doubtful that I'm going to have the exact image here using this technique. We're probably likely to get a very different result. I think this will probably be a much lighter. I, th I'm, 
might just do them all like this. I kind of, <laughs> kind of like this. This is kind of just weird enough to appeal to me that me, I'm kind of feeling like maybe it will do. I'll show the other technique. Should I? Do I get it? Should I get another one? Hmm. I mean, that's a. This is that's a. This is a good problem to have, where you're kind of like, oh, the results are surprisingly good enough that I might just do this whole thing with this technique. I do want to show a different one though. So, um, so, so far these are fairly even, fairly similar, but we want to. Uh, to, in order to replicate what Warhol's doing, we, we ideally want to get a little bit more variation. So maybe the, I'll do... I'll do... Let's do one... Actually, it might be worth... Okay, let's get this one done first. Oop, and it kind of slid around a little bit, so this one's probably going to not turn out very well at all. But... Ooh, okay, so that would technically be a very bad print. Like, if we did that and we were planning on selling that, that would be, uh-oh, we made a big boo-boo. Oh, that one's not good. But Warhol looks at that and says, Wow, that's great. That's great. So why don't we, I'm just want to, let's look at the original here. And just think about where we want to. Um, they're all pretty dark. Does it matter if we try to match? Maybe let's do one more that is got. Or you know what? Who cares? Who cares if we try to do this? Let's just. I'm going to take this one down without inking it again. So my expectation here is that because most of the ink came off here, that this one of all these three will have the least amount of ink coming off of it and look the, the quote unquote worst. Hmm, not bad either. Now we can do a very Warhol thing here, which is to just put this. Should we? Let's just do it one more right at the bottom. It doesn't quite f fit. I'm just gonna put it right there without inking it up again. So I inked, didn't ink again, and I didn't ink this one either. So technically, this should be even worse. <laughs> that's pretty funny like that is kind of fun. okay so I'm just gonna roll right along here this one's starting to get some glitter all over there that's all right um, okay let's, let's just ink it up I think I'm just gonna keep on going let's do all 15 of them on this plate One thing with printmaking in this way is your hands do get very dirty very quickly because um, handling this like this is just is not ideal. Uh, Warhol's also not really concerned about lining these up, so maybe I'm going to make this one a little bit higher. The, the benefit of a roller is it's going to give even pressure throughout. Right. 
might leave a little gap there. I will do that. So how about this one? I'm just going to use my fingers, and you can see it's not the best comparison because you know as as we're going here, the ink is starting to get into all these cracks. So we're almost my expectation is we will never see any of these like the first two unless we wash this and so maybe I'll, I'll do a few prints just with my fingers like this and see how that results not bad actually all right let's just keep on going here on a little bit of a diagonal here. Okay. Um let's do I'm almost thinking like the ones where I'm stamping with my fingers are turning out really good. Huh, that's weird. Printmaking is an art, and there's people who obviously devote their entire lives to this technique. And um, the university I teach at, we have a, a large printmaking department. And... Um, I've done a lot of printmaking in the past on, for my own artwork. I really like printmaking because it's, there's as much as, like if you're really, really good, a, a hyper craftsperson at it, you can get the exact results over and over and over again. You can get exactly what you expect. But I think like Warhol, I, uh, it's kind of fun to, to get it wrong. So let's put this in here. This one, in fact, I'm going to roll this because I got a lot of ink on there. And so I'm kind of wanting to get this darker one. Oh, and it's sliding around. Probably because there's so much ink on there. All right, very dark again. I think I want to. I want another dark one down here. So, even though this is probably all, if I stamped it again, I'd probably get a pretty good result. But I don't want a good result here. So I'm going to put more of this ink on here and get a bad result deliberately. really bad ones um, how about why don't we just work our way from the bottom right here let's put this one here it's gonna kind of go off the edge or should we should we go right up to it There's, it looks like there's plenty of ink on here. I'm just going to keep on going. And maybe I'm going to just not use ink it up again at all. Maybe we'll just let's keep on climbing up the painting. And we'll just use out the rest of the ink on here and just see how light it gets by the time we're done 
Oh, Lolly wants to know, does it look good with acrylic paint? Oh yeah, I was gonna show that too. So, I'll do another one uh, with just acrylic. It, it, it probably won't look as good with acrylic paint. That would just be my, I think I've tried to do this in the past with acrylic to less and less satisfactory results. I'm gonna put this guy right up top there. <laughs> so, uh, let's um, take a look. Oops. I'll just move this out of the way. I think that looks really cool. Does it look like a car crash? Uh, probably not. But does Warhols look like a car crash? Not really either, right? And I think that's, again, exactly what Warhol was hoping for, is that we would um, kind of lose the original image and, and not be able to really tell what's going on. So we have also lots of different types of prints happening here. We've got some that are more clear than others, and then some that are barely there, super faded, and some that are just totally obscured. We can't even really tell what's going on in there. So this is the kind of thing that would make Warhol proud. He would be very happy. This would is the kind of thing that would make my <laughs> printmaking teachers from uh, college like shudder because they'd be like, you didn't learn anything. <laughs> right? So, but that, I think that's fun. That is, that's pretty cool. I'm glad that that technique works well enough. Um, so I should have prepped more canvases to do this on. I'm kind of feeling like, I mean, I guess if I spend enough time, that will turn out well. I'm kind of tempted just to go nuts all over it. Um, let's see. See, I have a whole bunch of smaller canvases that let's I want to do that. Let's um give me a second. Where did I put those guys? <sighs> Sorry, gotta think about where I have a stack. Everything's in disorder, disarray. Um, one second. Where have I moved them? Hmm. Well, oh, well, this is, since this just happens to be here, this is one of the Warhols that we did, right? We just painted yellow, and then we just used the template to, to draw that and paint that in. We still see how that turned out pretty well. We did one with Banksy again. This is a couple of years ago. December 3rd, 2020, we did that. Oops, I'm getting my fingers all over it. November 19th, 2020. So you can find those in the description below. Um... I'm gonna take this and wash, if I can, don't drop it 50 times, wash it under the sink, and then I guess we'll just use another canvas. Or maybe I'll do it on that one, I don't know. So, uh, or maybe I'll let's just get a bucket of water here. I'm just gonna get some water in just a, a jug, and then I'll show you me cleaning it. Okay, so here's just a, a bucket of water. I can take this in here. Huh. 
<laughs> well, he says, I love it. Styrofoam plates are my default on my shopping list now. Awesome. Uh, as I said, you can buy sheets of all sorts of different sizes of just styrofoam plates at, I'm sure, Michael's Art Supply, Hobby Lobby, or um, maybe even a dollar store, depending on the kind of dollar store you might have in your neighborhood. You might be able to find, because often they're used uh, in classrooms for doing this exact type of activity um, as a printmaking exercise. So that's this is what the the plate looks like after you've cleaned it. Now, that's because all of the ink has gone down into the grooves. So we just have to. Um, it doesn't. That is not a problem unless it's really dried in there and then it's as that builds up it becomes a problem but let's say you've just left that in overnight all that paint would start to dissolve and you'd be able to get most of it out um i do want to dry it as much as possible if we're going to print with it again you want it to be as bone dry as possible <clears throat> Okay, I may even blow dry that. I am tempted to make another gray canvas. Ah, that drives me crazy. I can't. Of course, in ten minutes, I'm gonna find the. Oh, here we are. Okay. Okay, because there's a few things I want to do here. One of which is to see what often this is one of the things I used to do all the time at the end of a class is I just take whatever extra paint I had on my palette and I would just paint them onto these these little canvases that I could then use for this express purpose of um, of uh, doing little tests. Right, so let's. Let's just take a few different colors. How many of them do I need? I just want to run out halfway through again. So I'm going to use those three, and I'm going to put my gray on top of them. Now, you would want to clean this up as soon as possible, because that ink, we don't want that to, to dry too much on different surfaces, but let's... Oh, not good. Can I scoop any back in here? No, it's going to taint that, so we don't want to do that. But Every time I look at the chat, there's like a bunch of, I'm like, you know what? I probably am missing a big part of that conversation. I don't know what is being discussed there. So I'll come back later. Oops, that's maybe a little bit darker than expected. That's a gray. If I wanted to lighten it up, you know, honestly, I would probably just mix it again because trying to... I would have to use a lot of white to lighten it, and I'd have to add also a lot more matte medium. So I'm just going to leave it like that. If it's thin enough, then maybe on the second coat, if I did want to do a second coat, 
I could um, deal with it then. So I'm just going to paint over these panels just so we have a, a, a gray again. That's good enough. Let that sit there and dry for a moment. You know, one of the things that I've done over the course of my life is make a bunch of paintings, you know, around October and then give them away to people as gifts. And it's really cool because I see them at whenever I go to a friend's house and see them on the wall and um you know i have i have some wealthy friends and i have some friends that aren't so wealthy and um it's cool to see my work on the walls of people of all different kinds of backgrounds but if you make smaller canvases like this it makes it easier to to give them away if you're making really big paintings all the time, um, there's it limits the audience who's able to afford a painting like that. So just something to consider, you know, especially if you're a beginner artist. I, I've seen people go out and they buy these big canvases and then they want to sell them, and the only and it, because it takes them months to paint one canvas, they're they're unsurprisingly they want to get you know some a fair market value back for it but it's like well I mean who's gonna pay five thousand dollars for a painting by someone who's just starting out who may give up after a few months and move on to something else a lot of people when they're buying art are wanting to kind of support someone for a, you know they were like excited and thinking like well maybe what if this person goes on for a few years and keeps painting and the value of it goes up and i can show it to my friends and say yeah i supported this artist at the beginning and now look they're on the cover of such and such a magazine <laughs> which reminds me i've uh I, someone um who purchased a painting of mine like almost well, I guess 20 years ago sent me an email just yesterday um, of this painting I did of the of James Dean's car crash I did a whole series of uh, researching James Dean's famous car accident and where he died and retracing his his uh, last few hours and made this big painting based on it and uh, they have it hanging in their dining room I, I remember going over to their house to celebrate and just it's just funny that yeah that's coming to mind while we're talking about the car crash series of Warhols huh. did not think or plan that but uh, what a random okay so let's blow dry these I'm gonna mute the microphone and then I'm gonna We'll, we'll use some different techniques to do these.
<laughs> so that's this is interesting. It's cracking a little bit. I wonder these canvases have been around for a while, sitting in this basement. So I'm not sure what was in underneath here, but it did not was not happy with me. Okay, so we'll just save that one for a maybe. Um, well, he says, I wonder if corrugated cardboard would work well. Hmm, maybe. You definitely get that cardboard texture, the corrugated lines. I don't know if, how well that would work for I mean, you never know. Uh, Pascal says, uh, wondering how these were made. Probably need very liquid paint. Actually, you want the exact opposite. I, that's, I, you know, I'm sure probably a lot of people would 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 have the same instinct. But you actually want paint that is very thick and tacky. Uh, that's why printmaking ink is. It's kind of specially formulated. It takes longer to dry. It doesn't run or bleed. It basically gets onto the, the plate and sticks like that. Um, uh, and passes was sculpted on styrofoam plate. Yes. And Deborah says, yeah, after a couple times of inking it up, it would probably start to disintegrate. You could gesso the cardboard um yeah i mean i see a number of suggestions wrap well, let's wrap it with aluminum foil um then i don't know how you would get any kind of print off of it um in some interesting solution so well let's kind of explore um how we can use uh, acrylic for this same process um, acrylic paint so speaking thinking of what we we're just talking about I might just actually go right to my black paint just while we're right here this poor black paint is like finally I get to be used for a, on one of these episodes I've been sitting here in the paint box just every time everybody gets out and they get to play and make a painting and I no no not not today oh okay guys have fun oh that was my chance okay <laughs> so um let's try if we ink this up I'm gonna have to clean my this is kind of a bit of a pain to clean so I'm actually gonna take it over to the sink and, and clean it so give me a second and then we'll see if we can ink up with acrylic. Now, I would actually think acrylic, that black out of the tube, that would be my inclination is maybe the best result. Maybe, because we don't want it to be too thin. We actually, it's almost like you want to let it put some slow dry medium in it, but let it dry a little bit. Anyway, let, let's think about it for a second.
so I guess I want to take that and I'm gonna put it down here. So this is my my printmaker's ink, and this is my acrylic paint that we're going to use. I, and also doing this a few times, this is really gonna get. Uh, we'll start drying on the roller pretty quick. I mean, it's, yeah, I'm always up for being surprised. I'd have to think about like the form, the best formulation. So on, on the face of it, it looks the same. They should work the same. But it, probably not likely, because right now I can already see it's built up quite a lot on here. So let's do this. Right here. Focused. Okay. I'm expecting this to be one big black blob. What do you think? <laughs> not bad, but certainly not anywhere near what we got with the printmaker's ink. All right, but let's let's try it. Let's see if we do a few more here without inking it up again. Okay, I'm just using my fingers here. I'll do one more down here, and maybe I'll just use the roller. And the roller might have helped a little bit. Okay, let's move that out of the way. Let's put more ink. Making a making a mess in the studio. Yeah, I put too much on there. I can feel it. It feels more slippery than the um, than the, the printmaker's ink. Yeah, I mean, oops. 
you can definitely see more texture of the canvas. That's probably because I didn't gesso a second time. So there's going to be more of that weave comes through, especially where it's a little bit uh, lighter. Now, I'm, I'm happy to, to explore a few different versions of this. Um, like, let's say, uh, Pascal said, what if, what if it was more fluid? Well, let's, let's uh, rather than me just saying, take my word for it, why don't we just do it? And, and we'll just see how that effect works, right? So I'm just gonna add a little bit of, should we do, let's do one with just water. Right, so you can see it's kind of drippy, right? Can you see the water, the ink dripping off there? All right, so that's this is very fluid. So we'll get that. And let's ink it up. So I'm expecting this to be more transparent. Let's do this on this one because I have very low expectations for this little canvas that I kind of gunked up. But hey, I'm, I would love to be proven wrong. Let's just see. Kind of the well let's let's try doing a few more of them you never know could just be that first print sometimes doesn't turn out Right, so maybe not as great of results as one might hope. So it's just, I'm just gonna wipe this off rather than cleaning it entirely, which I'm sure some people could say, well, that's that's really why it didn't work out. It's because of that. This is a very non-scientific Well, he says you could uh, ink up only certain parts, then print over the dried images in another color. I'd like to see how that looks. Um, we could try that. Oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> comments there. Okay, so let's try a different one. Let's use uh, some black paint and I think what would make this, what would make the black behave like printmaker's ink. I want something, I almost want it to be thicker and more tacky. Um... Here's a few, I was, it's funny because I don't really have any material to make the paint behave in a more tacky way because that's usually like the least desirable thing you could possibly ever want. So I have a few things, one of which we can try using some fluid acrylic, right? So this is it kind of like what we were just talking about when we added water to it, but instead of water, 
this is it's more fluid but it's got like a materials in it to help um, make it more fluid like a medium in there and then the other would be heavy matte gel I also don't think this would work either but why not try a little bit of it and just see if this is a disaster or not um, so let's take some of this because this is an, a, a, trying to get a thicker type of a texture Oops. I mean, right now that actually does resemble, and it f I can feel the resistance of that swirling more than I have. You know, it, it reminds me of the tackiness of the uh, printmaker's ink. The one thing is printmaker's ink usually self levels after it's dry. Whereas this, if I have texture using the heavy matte gel, it's going to preserve that texture. So, you know, it would be amazing if, if this works and I managed to figure a way to, to do this. I would That would be so cool because then next time I go to a school, I could just be like, oh, I could just use all the existing materials and I'm just going to paint. I have this extra paint on my... Instead of throwing it away, we'll just wipe it right on here. But again, my, I have very low hopes here. Okay. Oops. Sorry, I just was inking that up. It's a lot of, that's maybe almost too much ink. So I'm going to very lightly ink up the plate. Because I don't want to flood all of the grooves. I do think it, well, is it better? I don't know. Um, let's try it again. It, it is very tacky. That's a good sign. So that, using the heavy matte gel here, mixed into just regular heavy body acrylic, I'd say this would be the closest I've seen yet to mimicking the the behavior a bit of the of the um, the ink. This one just use my fingers. Pascal, you crack me up. Pascal says it didn't. The paint police would say it didn't turn out because we didn't mix our own black. Very. That's probably what they would say. Hmm. So again, this is not scientific because it's. It is possible that we're not getting good results because I didn't clean my plate properly. And my plate is, is just um, full of paint and maybe even some water. So it, this, I, you know, if this was Mythbusters, I would say sort of inconclusive. But, but it does make me think this is maybe the closest we've come so far. I'm just gonna clean this plate off. I want to try doing maybe one with 
fluid acrylic. Evans Flora says it looks like stamp ink. It, it's similar for sure. Like printmakers, printmaking ink or block printing ink is uh, very is basically similar. It's it's a bit more heavy duty than just like your like I have stamp ink in here and stamp ink is is very fluid and then you're kind of stamping like a like a. A stamp into an ink pad as opposed to a, a, a inking plate. The other thing too is after you've used this plate for a while it's gonna become less and less effective. So it's really not fair to these canvases that I keep using them over and over. Um, just before I move on, I just want to, I'm just gonna make a note to myself. This one I think I just did with all just acrylic, right? Black acrylic on its own, I think, right? I, I mean... <laughs> For some people, that is just like ridiculously ugly. Warhol would have said, that's great. That's great. Love it. Do, you know what? I think I'm gonna, um, let's, I'm gonna clean this. And I want, I think I'm gonna show a, a totally different way of printing using some erasers and we can carve into it. Carly says, hey everyone, just popping in, just asking the teacher why we are using the stamps and not a silk screen. Is there something I'm not getting or am I just dumb? You're not dumb, it's just that most people don't have a silk screen or access to a silk screen or a printmaking studio. So I'm trying to show what people can do in the comfort of their own home with, with very basic materials. So, I mean, because you can buy that printmaking ink, block printing ink, I think it's maybe 10 or $12 for a tube. It might be a little bit more expensive. It could. It, even if it was up to twenty dollars, you can you like you barely need and like I've squeezed what like a quarter's worth out onto here, and I could probably do twenty or thirty prints with it. So yes, it might be a little bit more expensive, but you would have that printmaker's ink left for maybe a couple of years, even if you you made two or three hundred prints with it, right? So it is a higher cost outlay maybe than a regular tube of paint, but it's specially formulated for this purpose. So you don't really have to do any kind of tinkering to get the right uh, mixture to work. Um, 
yeah, let's. I want to do something a little bit different. Maybe I'll, I'll, with the other one, we'll try using a different, um, slightly different approach. Maybe we'll use a fluid acrylics on that. Okay, so the next uh, way that I want to show is by using some regular erasers, right? These are just regular, you know, um, erasers you can get from your art supply store or from the dollar store. And I'm going to put these onto a block. I'm going to screw them in from the other side. And... Um, then I'll carve into them. Right, so... Let's see if I can make this happen properly. So I so I purposely got uh, screws that won't go all the way through the the um, uh, of course I got the wrong bit in here um, yeah I'll show you in a second I do have the, the proper um, blocks for doing this, but again, I want to show we can anybody can do this. Right. <laughs> of course, the wood split because I didn't drill a Okay, let's, okay, do you think that will hold long enough to get a print done, that I can just keep on going here? Okay, those are on well enough. I want to screw those in even more, but I best not push my luck. Okay, so if you recall, remember this is my outline from the Dropbox. I used that to get it onto the canvas using the, the carbon paper. Now my hope is carbon paper will work. Hmm. Maybe just because this carbon paper is so well used. Pointed that that's not transferring. Hmm. 
This one is not really not going to work. Okay, so let's I'll just draw it out and then carve it. Okay, so just imagine that this is this block. Easiest thing to do would be just to divide this in half. Oh, and you know what? I wanted to be doing it on the opposite side, right? Because I want it to be stamped the right way when I flip it, right? So this is the other side. And let's just divide that in half. And we've got this post. And of course that pen stops working. Let's use a Sharpie. Good thing about an image like this is it's so obscure that if you try to do this, your results are going to be it's very forgiving because we probably won't know what was there to begin with anyway, right? I'm going to look at the screen. Okay, so I'm pretty happy. We'll, we'll go back to that in a second. I just want, I should have shown this maybe earlier. But here's sort of a box of, um, of supplies that we can, that I use for like printmaking. One of the things I love is collecting like old stamps that people have used. I use these, play with these with our daughter. You're like boo these are a bunch of Halloween themed ones uh, I have one made of my signature so that I can stamp lots of things a friend of mine got this for me uh, for a Christmas present so just took my signature uh, from one of my paintings and put it on as a custom stamp which has proved handy and so of course here's just your regular stamp pad and then extra stamp ink, right? Which is different. I mean, maybe hey, we, maybe we'll just try doing it with this. For, why not, right? Um, what you'll see here, the this is a, a, a proper stamp uh, pad, and what we would do is we can just carve directly in. It's basically what we've got here, right? We've just made our own do-it-yourself pad. Here's one. You can buy these like this. Here's again buy Speedball itself and um, you can just carve right into it. You can do this with with wood as well. So here's, here's one size. They make all sorts. They make huge sheets of these too which are very expensive. They're basically like um, giant erasers like this, right? Here's, you can get these kind of, they're like, what would you call it? Like linoleum tiles. I wonder what, kind, what does this say? Yeah, it's linoleum. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And so you can carve into this and print from that. People carve into wood blocks. That's how you have wood block printing. That's the oldest of all of the materials. And then you can also often find these old, um, stamping things like in at Salvation Army and that kind of stuff. Here's one for pro this was at the Students Union at Emily Carr's 
had like a um, a pro piece kind of demonstration like a decade ago, and they were throwing these away. I was like, well, I could peel this off just like this, and now I have my own ink pad, right? And I can take this off. So anyway, those. that um, but then we have these tools for carving right and you can I think you could probably buy this I don't know, I've had this for a decade or more but they come in with all these different shaped tools so you can get different ones for different kinds of uh, areas of your of your artwork so remember Wherever we carve will be white. Wherever we don't carve will be black. Um, so I just want to try to do this as quick and dirty as possible. Just so I can demonstrate this whole process. So obviously the deeper you go, the less black will get on there. Some of these, in fact, let's zoom in a little more. Some of these areas, they might show up a little bit. You know, this the grooves in between uh, the erasers, I can either, I can try to make it work and make them kind of blend in, or I can accentuate them. So, I'm just going to try to give a quick little experience of what this looks like. I've ever done a like a five minute block print but it's a first for everything Obviously, you want to be careful with your fingers, and you don't want anybody to cut themselves. You generally, want to be kind of cutting away from your body. Now, the great thing with like an eraser is they're just like they're so soft that this is pretty. Like I'm not having to groan and and to to really get this to work. It's sort of doing a lot of the work for me. So. That's good news. Just trying to think about how I want to do 
the remaining part in here. Maybe I'll try to do some fairly light grooves. Let's do a little cross hatch on here. It's not going to look anything like the original, but... One of my best friends, who was one of my um, groomsmen at my wedding... Um, we went to art school together, and then he took a bunch of time off to work on a career outside of art, and probably about like five years ago, got into printmaking again. He'd done a little bit of printmaking when we were in college. We were in the same printmaking class, but uh, now does this full-time, or not, well, almost full-time. And he makes prints of animals. I'll show you his, his website here in a second. But he just uses a very similar sort of technique at home. And he's got a, his own press. He, he makes these prints and he sells them. And people love them. And he was commissioned by uh, a museum in Alberta called the Royal Tyrell Museum. Which if you've never been to is probably one of the best museums in Canada. And I'm not kidding you. The Royal Tyrell Museum is dedicated to... Uh, is, is in Drumheller, Alberta, which is like an hour east of Calgary. And it's on this location where they found a number of really important dinosaur bones. And they built a really like an incredible museum and he was commissioned by the museum to to make a whole bunch of prints just like well similar to this of the different dinosaurs that they had recently discovered and it turned out great and I'm so happy for him his name is Eric Fossey maybe I'll just leave it like that I think that's that's probably good enough I think we see a few different techniques here. Now you can see my black lines and that can be a little bit distracting from trying to see what the actual image looked like. So let's just start printing it. Um, I'm gonna use just the, the regular uh, printmaker's ink and then we'll, maybe we'll clean it and then we'll use the a different inks to experiment with. The other thing too, this printmaker's ink is still very, it's still wet and ready to go. So, um, although I'm, I'm gonna add some more to it. Where's my, this place is a disaster. Okay, so here's my printmaker's ink. Again, this is the Speedball. You know, I think some people really think like the goal is to just get it really, really covered. It's not. You want it to be as even and as about as thin as you can get it. Because the, the more ink you have on here, the more that's going to get into all the grooves. And you're not going to have as quite of a clear of a picture. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to get it inked up. And then that's when I moved up here, I was actually trying to kind of get some of it off.
There we go. Because I don't want, I don't know if it's hard to see, but you can see there's like texture on there as it kind of pulls away and it creates this sort of veiny kind of quality. like kind of too too much clutter for my for my taste okay so now we've got our block pre uh, prepped here the other thing as I'm also thinking too this canvas remember is there's a lot of texture of the in the weave of the canvas so I'm also not expecting great results it almost makes me want to print this on a piece of paper first. Um. Here's some paper that I have left over from the last time I was in France. I haven't used this in a while, so I just want to try it on this because I I feel like we'll get a much better result than on the canvas first. So let's ink up our block. And you can really clearly see where that ink is going and where it's not going, right? Okay. Let's put it right in the middle here. Let's get our other view here. Oops. Are you ready? I want to make sure the paper doesn't pull up. Cool. Right? Really neat result there. So let's let's do that again. Do this on our canvas. Overlapping. You can see I got a little bit of my finger on there. See if I can kind of really load it up. Let's 
you know, it's it's almost hard to, to mess it up when you use this technique and this material to print with. But let's let's try to to mess it up. Where's my ink? Oh my goodness, I can't even find my printmaking ink anymore. Okay, well, since I can't find my printmaking ink, this is then we'll be transitioning to a different type of material to, to anyway. So, okay, that's fine. Uh, let's also just, I'm going to print it maybe down here and leave a gap. A Warholian gap. Okay. So uh, Donna said, what tool did you use to cut that with? So this tool, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but they're, they're printmaking carving tools. Let's see if the tool has a name on it. I think it's probably like 10, 15 bucks at an art supply store. It doesn't say the name of it on here, but it comes with a few of these other heads that you can you know put on instead so this one's got kind of like a a u shape this one's got a wider u shape even wider uh, some of them have like a uh, v shape oh here's one that is right so there's lots and lots of different kinds i mean I'm sure there's literally hundreds of different shapes and kinds and stuff, right? <clears throat> that that turned out pretty cool. I like that. It's definitely you're like, what on earth am I looking at? I have no idea. Um, Lolly asked for different colors, so how about let's let's ink this up? How did I lose my printmaking ink? There's only so many places something can take off in this vicinity, but apparently it did. Uh, let's use... That really drives me crazy. Because I know it's right here somewhere. <laughs> it's not like I went for a jog. 10 minutes ago and it's probably I'll see it within seconds of cleaning up and I know it's probably like actually right in front of my face okay well yeah Paul says Michael now that we can make our own prints we can do flowers birds etc cool yes that's what's kind of fun about learning a new technique like this, right? So I'm gonna see if I how much I can get away with with the existing ink on this block, or do I wanna let's do one like this. Maybe I'll try a few with with a few different uh, materials here. Okay, now I'm going to try with my heavy matte gel on the other side. I'm not going to wash this, which is, you know, might cause this paint to 
not behave properly, but... Not bad! So, that acrylic, heavy body acrylic paint with heavy matte gel is, is getting us a result that is like surprisingly similar to ink block printing ink. So I would say just based on this little experiment that if you had that around, you could probably get away with this exercise. It's not, it's not quite as good. That's for sure. See if I can roll the two of them together. What happens? Hmm. That's not bad. Okay. Let's quickly. So I'm gonna let I'm gonna blow dry those, and then I'll, I'll Lolly asked about using a different color, so we can try inking it a couple times. Just realized that music was on much louder than normally as I turned it up when I was doing a lot of blow drying, so. So ideally, you would really clean this really well beyond what I'm just doing here. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to do that. And I, let's blow, I'm going to blow dry these because you want it to be as dry as possible.
Oh, sorry, I was muted the whole time there. So what I was just saying is I just did the, the print again, really loaded it up, and I wanted to see how it would work compared to the first one I used with the uh, erasers that I carved into versus the last print. And they're, they, they held up pretty well, which is why using um, like a, a wood block or an eraser block or a linoleum block is going to hold up much better than a piece of styrofoam over time, right? The piece of styrofoam, you know, it's very flexible, and after you press on it a number of times, it's, it's going to lose some of the sharpness of the detail, versus this is going to hold up pretty good for hundreds and hundreds of prints. Anyway, um, so here, uh, that, I'm actually quite satisfied with how, how well those turned out after many uses. Okay. So, let's do a little bit of a wrap up and just take a look at a number of the different things we did. Um, I, one of them is not finished. Maybe that's something I'll do later on. Or, um, but uh, so let's actually let's start back. <laughs> let's go back to where we started and just see how well this one held up. Actually. Even before I do that, if you found anything we've been talking about helpful, you've learned something, please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell. Um, as well, if you want to make a donation, there's the super chat function down below. You can also donate using PayPal or contact me through my website, Facebook group. I encourage you to join the Facebook group. Upload your version of today's paintings or prints or both whatever you've created for us today we would love to see it and on saturday just a few days from now we're going to do a feedback episode where i'm going to gather all your incredible work together and we're going to celebrate it together and i'll give you a few little um, um potential suggestions on how you can make it even better right because i think that's what we're all after trying to get better So here's the first one that I began. This could, would, would take me another couple of hours to, to continue. I think I will do that. I'll probably film it and do a high speed uh, time lapse of it. But it gives you an idea. This is when we just used regular paint. We mixed our own black uh, to do that. And we could get some really cool, we, we'd be able to get do this. It's just gonna take some time, right? So I'm happy with the way it turned out. Um, I'd be, I, when it, it's finished I think it'll look great but um, let's see what a few of these other ones did this is the other one we created using our styrofoam plate and the styrofoam plate as I said held up pretty good right we we stamped it like this we also put some glitter onto the to the underpainting or the imprimatura as well. It's pretty hard to see, uh, but there there is going to be a little. Yeah, I don't think it's coming across very well on camera. What kind of thing that our daughter is going to love. <laughs> Let's see if you can see any glittery reflections. Not really. Um, but actually, I was very surprised by how well that turned out. And we deliberately kind of messed it up you, by kind of loading up, putting too much ink or paint. Uh, sorry, this one was ink, right, uh, on here. And we, we got some of these areas that are, that are too dark. But again, we this is why I chose this particular episode to explore printmaking is because there's if you mess up quote unquote then it looks just like a warhol right as opposed to if we tried to do a, another print uh, printmaker's work and we make them it doesn't it sort of looks like this then you'd feel really disappointed whereas here you can really embrace the imperfections just like warhol did 
Anyway, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased if we just zoom in a little bit on this. All right, we're able to get some really cool textures. All right, I think it's going to be kind of hard to see, but this will dry with a little bit of texture on there. That's got a very Warhol-like kind of quality. Right, some of them are just barely there. All right. Okay. And we've got uh, these small guys. So this one is, I think, the, the most recent one we just finished. This one, um, we did some uh, misregistration using a little bit of a different color. But by the end, this thing sort of got loaded up and kind of stopped behaving properly. So we kind of left it there. Here's another one that we kind of allowed just to kind of be like that. And I actually really like that. It's... It is a little bit strange, like I'm sure no one looking at it would have any idea what the origin of this image was. I'm fine with that though. Doesn't bother me, doesn't bother me at all. Um, oh, I forgot these ones here. These ones we used, this was, we tried just plain black acrylic paint using our our, our uh, styrofoam print or um, uh, uh, plate and the results it doesn't surprise me that this didn't work very well um, it, it it worked however I think better than when we mixed water this was water and heavy matte gel kind of turned up well, I was gonna say bet the best but maybe just the irregular acrylic works like you know, if we look at it side by side um, so this is with water, this is with heavy matte gel, and these are all just with acrylic paint. Yeah, I don't know. Compared to this one, which is using the Speedball block printing ink, I think it's there's really not much of a comparison there, right? One certainly worked better. However, as I've said, this is... After, it's not the most fair comparison because we we did use this many times and by the time we got to these we had done you know like what uh, 16 prints starting right here right so I don't know anyway I think that's um, that gives you a bunch of different options for how to execute today's painting by Andy Warhol whether you want to paint it or you want to experiment using some printmaking techniques. So um, that's enough for today. I, I, I do want to finish this painting, but um, uh, it's dinner time and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will see you on Saturday for a feedback episode. If there's any paintings you've been working on, you haven't taken a photograph, do that ASAP. There's a lot of material, so there's going to be a lot to celebrate on Saturday. And I'm not, or may even be Sunday evening. Now that I think about it, i got to check the schedule. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Join the Facebook page to find out when that episode's happening. We'll talk to you soon, everybody. Have a great night. And we'll see you again very, very soon.